Okay, good. Do you right? Ready to go? Sure. Jim, thanks so much for making time. I really appreciate it. Sure. It's great to see you again. Just what is it that you are interested in? How do you spend your days and, and why do you do it? I'm a neurosurgeon at Stanford, a professor. But uh, the thing that interests me a great deal beyond that is the work that I do at the center I founded, which is the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, of which, as you know, the Dalai Lama is the founding benefactor. What interests me greatly is, if you will, the value proposition of being a compassionate person, mm -hmm. being altruistic, not only in the context of how it benefits other people, but really the context of how it benefits you. There are different ways we study the brain. Uh, we can use imaging tools such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, which uh, demonstrates increased metabolism in different parts of the brain. We can use electroencephalography and a variety of other tools. Uh, but uh, basically what I examine is, number one, how compassion affects your brain, mm -hmm. and two, how that effect is manifested externally in the context of uh, your peripheral physiology. What do you mean by peripheral physiology? So one thing is the brain, which yeah. if you will is this internal thing that sits uh -huh. there, uh, but the other is how does it affect your body? Uh -huh. We know, as an example, that when you have thoughts in your head, you actually have an emotional response. Mm -hmm. Emotional response translates into physiology. As mm -hmm. an example, if you get angry, your heart rate increases, sure. you may feel this warm feeling. Mm -hmm. So when you have a compassionate feeling or an altruistic feeling, it also manifests itself in different mm -hmm. ways uh, externally. Stress, anxiety, they manifest themselves in your body in a very mm -hmm. negative way. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the problems in modern society. People are stressed out. So, sure. but interestingly, we know that if you are kind, compassionate, and actually do these types of activities with that type of an intent, mm -hmm. it actually has the opposite effect. It sure. calms you. It makes you feel connected. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel good. And that also transmits in a very positive way in terms mm -hmm. of your physiology. Okay, cool. So. Compassion links to your brain and that links to your body basically and, and it has a, an effect all the way through. I guess some of the work maybe with the Dalai Lama is trying to connect the spiritual practices as well to that idea of compassion. Uh, there is no question that spiritual practices can have an effect, but uh, what I would suggest is we look at it or frame it a different way into, if you will, uh, a mental practice mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily have a spiritual component uh, can have just as profound of an effect. Mm -hmm. When scientists first started studying the brain and the effect of meditation and specifically compassion meditation mm -hmm. on the brain, they actually uh, did this work with Tibetan monks. Okay. They actually had an electroencephalogram to measure that, and that's an electrode on your brain. Okay. And in this particular instance, it was like a cap that you wear mm -hmm. or on your head with all these electrodes coming out. When they showed this to the monks and told them what they were doing, they all started laughing. Right. And the reason they were laughing is because in the monk's perspective, compassion is not found here, mm -hmm. but is found in your heart. Sure. Uh, and obviously the scientists didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, the interesting thing about that, in some ways, what this, the monks said is actually true. Mm -hmm. Because we know that there are an immense number of nerves that actually come from your brain and your brain stem mm -hmm. that are manifested in your heart mm -hmm. and also throughout other organs in your body. But mm -hmm. a, a very a strong concentration in your heart. Mm -hmm. And we know that your autonomic nervous system is represented through that same pathway and it's called the vagus nerve. Uh -huh. When we talk about stress, anxiety, frankly that's a manifestation of fear mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. threat. Mm -hmm. When you feel those feelings, you get stressed or anxious. That is a reflection of increase in your sympathetic nervous system or your flight or fight response. Right. The opposite of that is increased parasympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. effect 
and that's represented by increase in your vagus nerve tone. Mm -hmm. When you are connected with somebody and being kind mm -hmm. or thinking of being kind, mm -hmm. your vagus nerve tone increases, your parasympathetic nervous system is activated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you get these very nice effects because that is our default mode as a human being. Sure. It is not to be terrified and fearful. Sure. It is to be socially connected. It is to care. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why when that happens or you act in that manner, mm. it has such a wonderful effect because that's how we're supposed to be. If you find a way to increase the parasympathetic activity, does that automatically create less activity in the sympathetic system? Yeah, it's almost like a seesaw uh -huh. or it's up and down. You right. can't have both. Right? right. If you look at our evolution as a species, mm -hmm. The things that make us human, compared to other mammals, uh, is we have something called theory of mind, where I know that you have independent thoughts, mm -hmm. you're separate from me. Uh, we have complex uh, language, and we have the ability to abstractly think. The cost of that was a requirement that our cortex dramatically increase in size. The cost of that was that our gestational period, or how long a pregnancy has increased, our litter size decreased, but the most important aspect was that unlike other species where the offspring are born and they just run off into the forest, mm -hmm. our offspring have an absolute requirement that they are cared for, mm -hmm. for a decade and a half or longer. Mm -hmm. And that decade and a half costs energy resources, it costs time, mm. uh, and there has to be a value proposition for the mm. caregiver mm. to make the effort. We are connected to our species, and when we are attuned to them, when we care for them, when we recognize they are at risk or suffering, we have immediately tuning into them mm. by uh, uh, interpreting facial expressions, body movements, or body postures, actually smell, sounds, where we can respond instantaneously mm -hmm. to uh, someone who is suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's why a mother is so attuned mm -hmm. uh, to her child. And that attunement results in the release, when you're caring, of this hormone called oxytocin, mm -hmm which is called the love hormone or the bonding hormone mm -hmm. because when you get that and that's the currency or how you were paid back for caring mm -hmm. it makes you feel really good mm -hmm. because it increases your parasympathetic tone now remember we're talking about the nuclear family but as we evolved as a species further to uh, the hunter-gatherer tribes that was our primary survival strategy to uh, six to eight thousand years ago. Right, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and that was in groups of 10 to 50. Again, hostile environment, lots of threat. And if you did not recognize or being able to interpret instantaneously that someone was in need, was suffering, what does that do? It puts the group at threat. Mm -hmm. So, again, it was critically important that you had these mechanisms to connect. Mm -hmm and to alleviate, if you will, another suffering. And when you do that, not only did the group benefit, mm -hmm. because obviously people function better, but again, you get the same feedback, mm -hmm. which actually makes you feel good. That reward circuitry that sets off the oxytocin, um, is there anything else that does that to us, or is it just compassion? I would suggest to you, it is activated when one connects with another human being. Right. And that connection can be manifested simply by a conversation mm -hmm. where one is attuned to another person mm -hmm. because that in and of itself is being kind or mm -hmm. compassionate because you're being present for somebody. Sure. Well, let me ask a really basic question. When you say the word compassion, what is it that you actually mean? In the uh, domain of neuroscience or psychology, typically what that means is that someone recognizes another's suffering mm -hmm. 
and has a desire to alleviate the suffering. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say they alleviate the suffering. No, yeah. It says they have a desire or an mm -hmm. intention because there are certain circumstances where you see somebody suffering but you have no way to mm -hmm. help them. Mm -hmm. Unlike, let's say, a term like kindness, where kindness doesn't have a connection to suffering at all. It's right. simply doing a good act towards somebody without an expectation of a reward. For our progression as a species, is there, would you place more importance on compassion or kindness, or do they both come hand in hand? Or, you know, what is important for us to cultivate and develop in our own lives to move forward individually and collectively? Well, I would suggest to you that for our species to survive into the future, the, the underpinnings has to be compassion. Mm -hmm. All of us in our lives have aspects which actually cause us pain or not ideal. And for us to move through society, we have to cooperate, we have to have connection, or everything breaks down. Mm -hmm. And so I would suggest to you that that's a critical part of how we function today. Mm -hmm. If you look at the news, it appears as though all there is is violence and tragedy. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting phenomenon because the reason that is presented to us is because news organizations know that what catches our eye as a species mm -hmm. is threat. Yeah. You see, we are much more attuned to threat mm -hmm. because that decides whether we live or die yeah. <laughs> versus, you know, if you're, let's say, on the savanna in Africa and you're just cruising around and you have plenty of food and water, you're happy, yeah. right? You're not worried about anything. But if a lion shows up, you immediately turn yeah. to that and it gets all of your attention yeah. because that's how we are attuned. If everything is fine, yeah. we're not looking around for anything else. We don't need to look around mm. for anything else. And that's why the media manipulates us because they know if there's tragedy, if there's at least they can sell us that something violent is going to happen, yeah. it gets our attention. Mm. Because the reality is 98% of the world is actually good. Mm. And 98% of people are trying to do good. And 98% of people want to do good. And yeah. they understand that that's critically important yeah. to our survival. It's this other stuff that is going on that isn't the majority of what's happening in the world. Yeah, I, ca I can't watch the news. I stop, I, I stop, when I was a kid, I used to leave the uh, living room when my parents were watching the news because I just used to cry when I saw everybody, all, all the bad stuff happening. And I just couldn't, it didn't, it didn't help me because I didn't watch it because I, I wasn't gonna do anything about it. And, and, and then I just got upset, you know, because I was just a kid, right? So these days I try to, I try to expose myself to stuff that I, so that it affects me, but then so I can take action. But that's why I stay very focused on things I actually can do, because otherwise I just get really upset about all the stuff I can't do anything about, which is why I still don't watch the news. And this is where something called compassion fatigue or empathic distress occurs. Mm -hmm. When you emotionally respond mm -hmm. to bad events mm -hmm. and you have no ability to impact them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's certainly understandable. All each of us can do is what we can do. Mm -hmm. In my conversations with economics professors, they're coming to terms with the idea that there is a utility that we gain through giving, and they call that the warm glow. Uh, and they don't have, in, in those conversations I've had, there's not a lot of insight in the economics domain about what that warm glow is. Do you talk about the warm glow in these fields? And if so, is it what we've already described? Or how would you describe what that utility is? Well, I would suggest to you that economists, the, the entire history of economics has been wrong. Okay. Okay? They have promoted this idea of selfishness and self-interest mm -hmm. as the motivator of human behavior. Mm -hmm. And at every step of the way, it has been wrong. And now they're suddenly surprised that they have suddenly found this concept of the warm glow. Mm -hmm. We know that, as an example, a study that I was involved with and has been repeated numerous times, is when we give individual monies mm -hmm. and they have a choice about spending the money on themselves mm -hmm. or others, the area associated with pleasure or reward is markedly activated when they actually give that money to other individuals. Mm -hmm. In fact, more so in many instances if they, than if they use it for themselves. Right. 
if then you actually take that money from them and they know it actually goes to benefit someone else, yeah. they get the same effect as if they voluntarily gave the money away. Oh, really? Yes. What do you think that suggests? Well, it suggests that in the service of others, mm. we have an inherent part of us that is happy when others are served. Mm -hmm. As an example, there was a study that was done in women over the age of 65 who did volunteer service, yeah. which is a form of caring or being compassionate, That's right? right. In those women who did a minimum number of volunteer hours, mm -hmm. their life expectancy was twofold increased compared to their age match peers. Twice. Twofold, twice as, right? right? Except with the following. One, if the person expected to get a reward. I really. Meaning that if their motivation was not pure or authentic mm. in the sense of service, but they wanted something like they were going to get a prize or mm. a certificate, mm. they didn't get the effect. Mm. Or if they were doing the action to impress someone. So somehow, if you get a reward, either a social reward or a tangible physical reward, it somehow maybe turns it from an act of service into a transaction, and then the utility wasn't gained. Well, I'm not sure if utility is the right word, sure. but yes, the benefit of caring yeah. to yourself yeah. is not achieved. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that means there, you can't fool uh, yourself mm. that you're somehow being authentic Sure. When you're not. Yeah. Life is busy and ever more bombarded with stuff in social networks and TV and billboards. The toughest thing for me is to be reminded that of all the things that you just mentioned. Do you think it's possible to do what I'm trying to do, which is to try and form a system of some description using technology and business that can help us take this compassion and turn it into kindness or action? Have you seen it happen or do you believe it possible? Well, first of all, I've seen it, and I believe it's possible, and I, you're already doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think you've already answered the question. The challenge for you is uh, nothing generally is ever easy, especially mm -hmm. things that are important. Mm -hmm. And it takes effort, and life in and of itself often has setbacks. Mm -hmm. Anything uh, that is worth going on that path, uh, is going to make you feel sometimes like, did I make the right decision? Is it worth it? Mm -hmm. Is it possible? And I will tell you that it is. Mm -hmm. If you have this burning desire and you recognize that at the end of this, the potential, and you may fail, mm. but if you realize that there is something at the end here, that is so worthy, that is so important, that is so impactful, it will wake you up every day and give you the energy to keep mm. going. And, and there are people who truly believe, and if you look for them, they will be there for you. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Jim. I really appreciate you taking time. So. Okay. Cheers, dude. Thanks, man. Okay, dude. I really appreciate that. Sure. It's really cool.